This event is organized under the umbrella of the Horizon 22 project efficiency and organized by the following people and organizations. A unique characteristic of the efficiency project is that it has a circular champion, a person responsible for integrating circular economy in the project as a cross cutting priority. I would like to give a warm thanks to Lola Rodriguez Coronil from North in Norway for initiating this event together with the rest of the amazing organizing team. The iEfficiency sister project in Horizon 2020 and other collaborators have also supported this event. We would like to say thank you for all of our great partners championing this important uh -huh. initiative. I would like to inform you all that this event will be recorded and that we are live. So please remember to mute your microphone at all time. And please show some courtesy to all the participants in the meeting and also within the chat channel. We need you to get engaged in this conversation. So please promote no, okay. and share interesting findings from this no, event no, using the hashtag no, circular no, economy. No. I would like to kindly remind you that please mute your microphone at no, all times no, unless no, you no, are no, speaking. No, no. We would vale, like vale, everyone vale. to be so, very so, active in the chat and also please remember vale, to raise your digital vale. hand during the OPAL panel discussions. Uh, we will vale, invite vale, you to the vale, board vale, to vale. some comments and questions. Vale. Before starting with the content and all the speakers, we would like to ask a question to everyone in the audience using our Mentimeter. On the screen and also in the chat, the organizers have shared a login code to Mentimeter. We would like to have from you some keywords in our word cloud on what comes to your mind around the topic of circularity in aquaculture. We would like for you to share and submit your answers. And then we will also revisit this word cloud later into the program and see if anything has changed during this program. So please, I will give you one minute to log into menti.com and also see the link in the Zoom chat and please submit your answers. And my organizing team will soon get up this cloud on the sharing screen. Uh... Necesito comprobar si me deja lo que me acabe. I would also like to remind you to use your microphone. Yo creo que no puedo hacer el video. Está para el mío. Thank you so much. We already see that your answers are getting submitted into the word cloud. So these are the audience answers when it comes to what comes to your mind on the topic of circularity in aquaculture. We definitely see that sustainability is one of the words that is definitely, I will say, uh, really standing out here. We see multi-trophic waste management. We also see job creation, responsibility, innovation, collaboration, climate change. I'm really looking forward to the panel discussion later today and also to see how circular economy also can have a very positive impact when it comes to climate change and the impact on our food systems. So please, we encourage you all, keep posting and submitting your answers into the word cloud, and we will also revisit your answers later into the program. It is now a great honor for me to now to invite to the first session of the program, Circular Economy and Sustainability in the Aquaculture Sector. We will kick off this session with two keynote speakers. And then we will have a panel discussion with some invited experts. 
in the panel discussion, we encourage all of you in the audience to raise your digital hand or submit your question in the chat. And we will invite you to the floor with your name. And please remember, keep your microphone on mute on all time unless you have been invited to the floor. It is my great pleasure to introduce the first opening speaker of the event, Wojtek Wosecki from Circular Economy. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, right now talking to you from Gothenburg, Sweden. It's already light outside, which is great news for the whole country, but it's not gonna last that long with the winter coming. And let me get right to the point by sharing my slides. My name is Wojciech Wosetsky. I'm an associate of Circle Economy, a global foundation working around the world with countries, businesses, regions, and cities, helping those with advancing towards the circle economy with practical and scalable tools towards the circle economy. And today, I have prepared a 10 minutes presentation about a topic which is very close to my heart, a circle economy, and also to my career, with the provocative question, is that the missing link to feed the world? But in order to answer that, I think we need to look at where are we today? And uh, there's so many angles to that, but I would like to share my own personal one on the state of the art of our planet. We are almost about to be 8 billion people on this planet. And in the next 30 years, by 2050, there'll be 10 billion people of us. And we're seeing that already today, the planet is facing enormous threats and pressures from different sources. And one of them is, of course, the population growth, another is the consumption. And from the consumption perspective, we're seeing that the planet is not keeping up with what it's able to provide us in a sustainable manner. And already today, we would need 1.6 planets to sustain our needs in a sustainable manner. And if everything goes this way, we'll need three planets by 2050. One of the main reasons, in my view, is that we live in an incredibly wasteful society where we take things off the ground, we make stuff out of them, and before sometimes they're even consumed, we waste them. And food is at the heart of this issue. About 1.3 billion tons of wood, uh, food produced every year is wasted. That's about one third of world food production. While at the same time, around 800 million people do not have enough to eat today. And that number has increased during the COVID crisis. And the simple answer to the question at the start of my presentation is, yes, we can feed the world already with what we are producing today, but we have to eliminate the waste on the supply chain from the production to the final consumption at the households. And that issue is very differently distributed in the global north and the global south countries. What we're also seeing with the food systems today is that the packaging is an enormous issue. And uh, if everything goes the same way it's been going, there might be more plastics than fish in our seas and oceans in 2050. Because already today, every year, we're putting around 8 million tons of plastics in our seas and oceans every year. And another issue that I see that the aquaculture really has uh, a potential to solving is the extreme inefficiency in our supply chains. Let me tell you a story of this poor cod that was caught at the coast of Britain. It was shipped to China to be processed and shipped back to the UK and sold around one mile away from the place where it was caught. And this was all because it was 50 pennies cheaper to do so. Going through, through the Suez Canal, and we all know what happened over here a couple months ago, we're seeing that these global supply chains, which are extremely inefficient and putting a lot of pressure on our environment, are also fragile. And uh, we need to get our heads around how to change this. Last but not least, and there's so many angles and problems with our food systems, and I don't, I'm not a big fan of pinpointing the obvious and the wrong, but I think it's important to uh, start the narrative with the problems that we wanna solve because every problem for circular economy is also a very big opportunity to solving. And 
uh, a problem close to my heart is the issue of fertilizers, the mineral fertilizers specifically, which are um, critical nutrient for food systems production because they're used in the global fertilizing business. And uh, when it comes to Europe, Europe is extremely dependent on this raw material, which was actually labeled as a critical raw material not so many years ago, next to rare earth metals mined in China. Now we have the phosphates. About 92% of phosphates are mined in just three countries and transported to EU, Tunisia, Morocco, and Russia. While at the same time, we're seeing that this raw material is going to run out. According to the estimates by the European Commission, in the next 60 to 80 years, it will be extremely difficult to mine new mineral phosphates. And we'll need to look at where to get that material elsewhere. And the answer is in front of us. This is the US, and this is uh, a problem that we're seeing around the world when it comes to the nutrients that we're putting in our soils, but we're losing them and they're released into the environment. In this case, the uh, Mexican Bay Delta through the Mississippi River. The green is the uh, nutrient um, uptake by the rivers from the fields and the red is the nutrients that the cities produce. And it's all going down through the Mississippi River to the Mexican Bay where it's basically fertilizing the ocean which means that um, the algae thrive. They love those fertilizers, but it's uh, such a dangerous situation for all the other life in the bay. And uh, basically what's happening is that a dead zone is existing in that bay and it's expanding because all these algae are eating oxygen necessary for all other life forms to exist. And of course, this is just one example, but we're seeing it in many, many other rivers and river deltas around the whole world. When we zoom out even more and we look at what has happened over the last 250 years, we're seeing that we have experienced a tremendous socioeconomic trend and growth in terms of population, GDP, investment, energy use, but also fertilizer consumption or paper production. But we're seeing that this unprecedented growth has had an enormous impact on our earth system trends such as releasing the carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, methane, nitrous oxide, ocean acidification, and nitrogen to coastal zones. I am of the opinion that one of the main reasons this is happening is that we live in a world which is called a linear economy. As I mentioned, a world where we take things off the ground, we produce stuff out of it, and then we waste them. And I think the solution lies in a world which is circular, by design, a world where there's no waste, where waste is a resource and where resources flow in perpetuous loops without a loss of quality, ideally forever. It's important not to mistake circular economy with so-called recycling economy, which we're also seeing in the EU as well. The narrative is being changed and we are lying to ourselves that as long as we recycle and separate everything, we will solve this issue. But I really wanna stress this, Recycling is not the solution. It's an important tool for circular economy, but it's not the only tool in our tool belt. If you're wondering how circular our planet is, look no further because circular economy is every year producing a report together with World Economic Forum about a state of circularity of our planet. Last year, our planet was 8.4% circular, 8.6, excuse me. Um, and we looked at the total resources entering the global economy, and we estimated that number was about 92 gigatons. And we're seeing that biomass and nutrition is playing an incredibly important role in driving that linear economy forward. And only 8.4 gigatons of resources make it back. We also linked that discussion to the discussion about the global greenhouse gas emissions. We're seeing that um, the total production is about 60 gigatons, and again, biomass, and nutrition is such an important part of that issue. We also, the good news is that we can close this gap. If we double the circularity, we can meet the Paris goals. And we have stressed out several strategies related to these um, societal needs, such as nutrition or housing, that can solve this issue. One of the main ones we're seeing with food in green is 
the reducing excess consumption, but also producing our food more sustainably and also going with clean cooking stoves. Now, to be a little bit more specific about what can circular economy do in order to get us out of this locked in disastrous road ahead of us, I have chose this picture with a city in the heart of it because cities are at the forefront of our consumption and about 70% of people will live in cities by 2050 and that's 7 billion. We can redesign the systems by changing our supply chains, by going more local with production and consumption. We can harmonize with nature by regenerative approaches, by using what we have, not allowing the nut nutrients entering the ecosystems, but closing them in and reusing them again. We can eliminate the single-use packaging by going reusable, refillable, or up to almost close to 100% collection and recycling rates when necessary. We can and should do better with less. We absolutely need to reduce food waste. And if that food waste is produced, we need to close the loop with it. We need to put it back to our soils while extracting the precious nutrients and energy that's hidden in it. And allow me to conclude with a little bit of a provocative question. Is circular economy sustainable? The quick answer is no, but it can be. And I chose this picture because I think it really shows everything. This is SpaceX rocket, which is reusable. It's a radical redesign of the whole space rocket industry. It achieved tremendous savings from an environmental and economic perspective. But in why are we using that? What are we doing with those rockets? Is the intention to use them really sustainable? And I think this is at the heart of the problem with the circular economy. We need to challenge the consumption patterns that are related to our society. And circular economy discussion is not doing that today, but it can help with moving us to reach the Paris goals if we get it right. There are more issues with circular economy where it's actually not sustainable when we think of safety and toxicity of what we're putting back and ex extracting. Also, I think the social aspects of circular economy are being widely neglected these days, whereas sustainability is very much connected to the sustainability issues and the social aspects as well. But since I'm running out of time, I will leave it here. Thank you so much for your attention. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the event and to the discussion that will follow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wojtek, for some very, very powerful messages in your presentation. And again, a kind reminder to all of you in the audience, Wojtek will be joining us in the panel discussion after our next speaker. Please have your questions ready for Wojtek. And I really enjoyed what you say that the challenges that we see for the planet are opportunities in the circular economy. It is my great pleasure to invite the next speaker to the floor, Birgit van Tongelen from DG Mare from the European Commission. Please welcome Birgit to the floor. Good morning, everybody. I'm happy to be here. Um, thanks for inviting me. I will present today the communication on the new strategic guidelines for EU aquaculture that were adopted by uh, the European Commission in May this year. So but I forgot to say um, who I am. So I'm Birgit van Tongla. I work in the European Commission in DG Mari, the D Director General for Maritime and Fisheries. Um, I will focus today um, so on the strategic guidelines for a more sustainable and competitive aquaculture that were adopted by the Commission last May this year. And I would like to underline that this has been a result of more than one year of close consultation uh, with EU member states, experts, and also with the Aquaculture Advisory Council. So that is um, the council, there are all the aquaculture stakeholders represented. And these stakeholders also take into consideration uh, the result of a public consultation that the Commission launched on the challenges and the opportunities uh, of EU aquaculture. Today, I will focus on the aspects related to environmental performance, um, because these aspects address or cover also uh, the circular economy. Next slide, please. 
But let me start um, by reminding you how EU aquaculture policy is made. As you know, um, aquaculture in the EU needs to comply with a lot of EU legislation. So for example, on animal health or on animal um, environmental protection. Um, but beyond that, the regulation uh, of aquaculture remains largely with uh, the member states. And here in this slide, you can see the different elements of EU aquaculture policy. You have the guidelines, the European uh, strategic guidelines developed by the Commission that are the basis for the strategic coordination of action on aquaculture in the EU among the member states. Um, and so the cooperation, it's a, a voluntary cooperation between the Commission and the member states. They are established by the um, Common Fishery Policy Regulation that also established the objective of sustainable development of aquaculture in the EU to ensure food security, uh, to reduce the pressure on uh, fish stocks and to provide jobs and economic development. So these are the Commission guidelines. Then at the right hand side, you have the national strategic plans. So the EU member states adopt national strategic plans for aquaculture, translating these Commission guidelines into their particular realities uh, and also setting concrete growth ob objectives. The Commission is facilitating the exchange of experiences and best practices on the implementation of the national plans among the member states. And this is done under the so-called open method of coordination, what you see in the middle of the, of the slide. An important element, of course, um, of EU aquaculture is obviously the funding that the EU has made available to support the sustainable development of the sector. Um, there is the EMFF, so the European Maritime and Fishery Fund, uh, but also other programs like uh, Horizon 2020. Most of the elements here uh, that you see in the slide, so most of the elements of the EU aquaculture policy have been reviewed, starting with the Commission strategic guidelines. So there was guidelines in 2013, and now the new guidelines in 2021 have um, re revised these 2013 guidelines. Member states are also reviewing their national strategic plans based on the Commission guidelines. And also the funding programs are um, uh, reviewed for the period 2021-2027. So there is now the MFAF, the European Maritime Fishery and Aquaculture Fund, and Horizon Europe and also other EU funds are available. Next slide, please. It should be said that the new polit political context like the European Green Deal and the Farm to Fork have given a stronger role to aquaculture. So the European Green Deal uh, refers to seafood as a source of low carbon food. And also the Farm to Fork strategy that was adopted in May 2020 um, this farm to fork strategy calls for an accelerated transition to sustainable food systems. And in here, aquaculture has, of course, a role to play in um, contributing to the transition to sustainable food systems. In the farm to fork strategy, there is a reference to a clear reference to aquaculture. It is said that farmed fish and seafood generate a lower carbon footprint than animal production on land. And the farm to fork strategy also sets specific targets for EU aquaculture, notably that there should be a significant increase um, in organic aquaculture by 2030, and also that there should be a reduction of the sales of antimicrobial in, um, in aquaculture. Those, these are specific targets for aquaculture uh, in the farm to fork strategy. And of course, aquaculture has to play a role also in, um, in other EU strategies like the bioeconomy strategy and the biodiversity strategy, but that uh, I will not go into further detail. Next slide, please. So what are the key objectives of the new strategic guidelines? The key words are growth, sustainability, resilience, and competitiveness. And as the title of the guidelines show, 
So the guidelines aim at proposing a path towards a more sustainable and competitive sector for the period 2021 to 2030. So the, um, the guidelines consolidate all lessons that are learned um, in the implementation of the national strategies, also lessons learned from exchanges in the context of the open method of coordination and lessons learned from relevant EU funded projects. Um, the guidelines also aim to ensure that aquaculture plays its role in meeting societal demands, notably contributing to the objectives of the European Green Deal. And they make proposals on how to maximize the impact of available instruments and tools on the performance of the EU aquaculture sector. Next slide, please. The new strategic guidelines set four horizontal specific objectives, as you can see here, building resilience and competitiveness, participating in the green transition, ensuring social acceptance and information to consumers, and increasing knowledge and innovation. The guidelines identify uh, 13 different areas for, uh, where further action is needed, for instance, on animal health or on animal welfare, on communication. And these areas are grouped under these four horizontal objectives. And for each of those areas, the guidelines also provide concrete recommendations for actions. Next slide, please. So, Today, I will talk about the horizontal objective um, participating in the green transition. The two areas of work that are mentioned there are uh, improving the environmental performance and environmental um, uh, animal welfare. Sorry. Indeed, um, environmental performance of the EU aquaculture sector can and should be improved, and that can be achieved by ensuring that the environmental legislation is implemented, is properly implemented, um, by further mitigating the impacts of aquaculture, and also by promoting aquaculture with lower environmental impact. For instance, uh, um, lower trophic species like mollusks and other invertebrates, algae and herbivore fish, and also promoting aquaculture that provides ecosystem services like, for instance, fish farming in ponds. Next slide, please. Um, to improve the environmental performance of the EU aquaculture sector, the guidelines identify a number of issues that should be addressed. And these are listed here. So the areas of focus are ensuring sustainable feed systems, so using sustainable feed ingredients, limiting the reliance on fish meal and fish oil that are taken from wild stocks. Uh, for example, um, using alternative proteins like algae or insects or waste from um, other industries. It also mentions the veterinary products, the product, so uh, reducing the use veterinary products and promote the use of veterinary products with a smaller environmental uh, footprint, ensuring environmental monitoring of aquaculture sites, including the water quality, discharges and emissions, limiting the contribution of aquaculture activities to marine litter, promoting the use of renewal and renewable energy sources and greater energy efficiency, implementing waste management systems. And then um, here we come to the, the topic of today, applying a circular economy approach, including the use of waste. So here you can see that the circularity is mentioned in the new strategic guidelines for EU aquaculture as an issue that should be addressed or an area where further work is needed. Also, um, there is a focus on organic aquaculture and on other um, aquaculture types with a lower environmental input impact like um, energy efficient recirculating aquaculture systems or integrated multi-trophic aquaculture system. Um, so these, um, these um, types of aquaculture will be promoted. Also the um, 
the forms of aquaculture that offer ecosystem services, for example, fish farming in ponds. So this is a short overview of um, the areas of focus that are highlighted in the strategic guidelines under the chapter improving the environmental performance. Next slide, please. Um, yes, the strategic guidelines do not only provide a vision for the EU aquaculture sector, but in the annex, there are also recommended actions, um, recommendations for actions, uh, not only for the Commission, but also for the member states and for the Aquaculture Advisory Council. And these actions are in the different, uh, in the 13 key areas for further work. So I will focus here on the actions related to improving the environmental performance um, for the Commission. For the Commission, um, it is said that an, a guidance document on environmental performance in the aquaculture sector will be developed, and that guidance document will include, um, for instance, guidance on implementing EU legislation, but also the mapping of good practices. Mapping of good practices um, from good practices from the government, but also from the industry. And this can cover a range of issues, like um, I mentioned before, sustainable feed, energy efficiency, how to reduce the carbon footprint. And uh, of course, here we could also mention um, the circular approach and waste management. So the guidance documents on environmental performance that will be developed by the Commission will include um, good practices on circular, eco circular aquaculture. Another um, action is uh, the support to the diversification of EU aquaculture to types of aquaculture with a better environmental performance and working on um, the contribution of um, the limiting the contribution of aquaculture to marine litter. And of course, support um, um, further research and innovation to improve um, environmental performance of the sector uh, inter alia under Horizon Europe. Then we come to the recommended actions for the member states. Um, one of the most important actions is uh, that member states are encouraged to promote and disseminate the guidance on environmental performance that will be developed by the Commission and that I mentioned earlier. Um, so um, disseminate is among authorities competent for aquaculture and also the aquaculture industry and support the industry to adopt such practices. Um, as I said, um, guidance, good practices on circular uh, aquaculture will be included here. Then Thank you so much, uh, Birgit. Um, we are running a bit short of time, so if you can just jump to your final conclusions before we continue to the panel. Yes. Okay. So um, the the um, sorry the actions for the member states you can read here, and there are also actions for the. Aquaculture Advisory Council, also related to the guidance document. Then the next slide talks about what is next. So it is important to know how we will implement these guidelines and to support the implementation of the guidelines, the Commission will set up an assistance mechanism. Uh, this is a tool to support the Commission, the Member States and the industry um, to develop further guidance and also to help uh, implementing um, the strategy. The mechan I still want to mention that the assistance mechanism will also include a platform, a kind of website that will um, have a knowledge base that will be accessible uh, for all the stakeholders. And this knowledge base will include a lot of information under which also good practices, for instance, on circular aquaculture. Voila, this is in a nutshell what I wanted to say, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Birgit. It is a pleasure to have you with us, and Birgit will also be joining us for the third block of this event during um, input for policy guidelines to support more circular economy in aquaculture. 
We will now like to invite our panel experts to the floor. It's my great pleasure to invite Zora Kovacic from the Universitat of Orbeta di Catalunya, Eva Enyedi from Climate Kick, one of the knowledge and innovation communities under the Horizon 2020, and back to the floor also Wojtek Wosaczki from Circular Economy. To all of you in the audience joining us live, please remember to share your questions in the chat or raise your digital hand and one of my organizing team will also invite you to floor to be able for you to ask the panel experts a question. I will just kick off this panel discussion with a first of my questions going to Eva and Yedi from Climate Kick. Wojtek also mentioned this in his presentation that maybe circular economy is actually a solution when it comes to the climate challenges that we see. From a climate kick perspective, how do you see circular economy being a solution or a contributor when it comes to climate mitigation within the food system? Well, uh, thank you everyone for, for being here and thank you for having me today. Uh, what I really would like to highlight that we could see from Voitex and Birgit presentation is that opportunities for circular economy are, are enormous, but it's also incredibly complex because we are talking about whole value chains. And in my opinion, the biggest opportunity uh, when, within using circular economy as, an, as a tool for tackling climate change is to rethink and redesign whole value chains from the perspective of climate action, not just reducing the carbon footprint, but also the environmental and, and human aspects of any resource that we create, uh, how we source um, a resource, how we consume it, how we dispose it, making sure that um, any change we make in a value chain is taking into consideration the carbon footprint and also the, the environmental and human aspects of that resource. So for example, if we take the example of a fish, where it has been sourced, how it has been fed, uh, how it has been consumed and how it has been disposed, at what time of the year and by whom. So it, it is incredibly complex. And I think circular economy, because it introduces a new way of thinking and a new way of collaborating across value chains, it offers uh, incredible opportunities for us if we use them well to make a big change. Thank you so much, Eva, for sharing some very interesting perspectives. Uh, my next question goes to you, Zora. Uh, I mean, the aquaculture industry, as at least I know it, has had sustainability very high on the agenda, making some really impressive progress when it comes to lowering the environmental impact. Will you say that circular economy is a driver to increase the sustainability efforts in the aquaculture industry or what is your views and perspectives on that? Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Um, I, I would like to share a little bit of a critical perspective to, uh, well, hopefully increase the diversity of uh, perspectives in, in the debate. Um, so yes, definitely the circular economy has been high on the policy agenda and especially in EU policy, which is uh, my area of study. And there are many promises linked to the circular economy. It's supposed to provide new business models to deliver economic growth, uh, to deliver sustainability, to make it possible to decouple economic growth from resource consumption, and even to be regenerative for the environment. So the question that I would like to raise is this, is this discourse too positive? From a scientific point of view, the answer is, well, not so fast. Many of the materials that are used in the economy are degraded when uh, used. Uh, energy, for example, and food um, are degraded. Uh, so emissions cannot be recycled and turned back into fuels or electricity. And this is also known as the second law of thermodynamics, the entropy law, which tells us that some processes are irreversible. So the same goes for food, for fish that cannot be recycled, recirculated in the economy after use. Um, so the materials that are degraded to reuse, they make up more than 50% of the material flows that go through the economy, like what I was showing earlier in, in the graph. And for this reason, some scholars say that the economic process is entropic and cannot be circular. 
Another about 40, 45% of the material flows is construction material that is added to the building stock and is also not recirculated. So in contrast with the big promises of the circular economy in practice, um, over 90% of materials are not recirculated. And this is why, as we were saying before, the global economy is about 8% circular. And here I would like to raise another question, which is, can the economy be more circular than 8%? If we manage to collect, uh, properly sort and recycle and reuse all materials that can be reused, could the economy be more circular than 12%, which is what it currently is in Europe? And importantly also, if not, does it make sense to put so much hope for sustainability in the hands of the circular economy? Interesting. And thank you so much for sharing also a bit of a more critical view. Just a Quick question to you, Wojtek, before we open the floor also for some questions. Uh, based on your work, uh, working with circular economy in a global food system, is there any particular area that your organization has highlighted where you see that maybe our culture can really have an impact when it comes to increasing the circular economy uh, in Europe? Thanks, and I promise to get back to it, but I think that the questions that Zora uh, asked are brilliant and I feel like I would love to respond to them shortly before getting back to your question. That's okay. I, yes. uh, I agree. I, I, I think we're putting a lot of hope in circular economy. It's so popular concept, right? It's sexy. It's um, everyone now is talking about circular economy because we are not challenging the deep rooted issues with our global systems right? When it comes to, and I would say the consumption and, and the, the whole GDP madness that we need to grow and grow and grow endlessly without looking back and also to the future. I think circular economy is, is not challenging that today. And that's why everyone is jumping on board with it from uh, us. I'm guilty of that as well, because I still think that um, nevertheless, you know, even with the system that we have today, we can achieve enormous gains and savings and, and rapid changes. But as long as we are stuck in a debate about growth based on GDP, which is driven by consumption, we will always be trying to catch a train which will go faster and faster than we can ever cope with. And that's why we're seeing that the circular, circularity is decreasing. We started with the gap report when it was 9%. Now it's 8.6. And I'm pretty sure that in January 2022, when we will release another report, it will be even less than 8.6. And I would be so happy if it wasn't the case. Um, so we need to ask the tough questions. And circular economy is not doing that. Sustainability is. And there are amazing concepts like donut model, degrowth, which I think we need to incorporate. And, and I think, in a way, circular economy is extremely powerful, but it's getting outdated. And, and especially because the, the societal aspects are being neglected with a global debate around it. Nevertheless, and now coming back to what you asked as well uh, at the start, um, I think it's the best we have at the moment, at least, and I'm biased of that opinion, of course, I'm, I'm working with it for years and years, uh, but I'll tell you why. I think from, from the examples that I showed, um, there are, a terrible things happening that uh, can be fixed. Sometimes it's difficult and sometimes it's easier. Packaging, I mean, it's crazy. We'll have maybe more plastics than fish in our oceans in 30 years. Um, circular economy can really change that around. If we go reusable, refillable, and I think the aquaculture is a way to help with that as well. I mean, it's connected with the supply chains. Uh, maybe we won't need to transport cod across the whole world and back in order to feed the people. Maybe we can uh, uh, produce and source and feed locally. And this is again, where I see the huge gains that the aquaculture can bring because it's controlled or semi-controlled environment, right? Um, it's efficient. Uh, look at how the traditional fishing business looks like today, right? Um, fishing in deep seas, bycatch, the waste that's connected to it. I think this is where aquaculture 
is offering a health, healthy alternative that is way more efficient, not only in eliminating waste uh, from the production, but also being way more energy efficient than um, the current ways of, of uh, producing our food. Thank you so much, uh, Wojtek, uh, for sharing those uh, perspectives. We just really want to also invite the audience also to the floor uh, there. So maybe, Danny, are there any questions maybe from the audience that are directed to some of our panel experts? Uh, I would welcome uh, some of the people asking questions if they like to raise their hand and we can invite them. I, I do see a question uh, here in the chat from Oliver Fredrickson, uh, and they are asking, would circular guidance be on an individual and site-specific basis, for example, farm by farm, or could it be a one-size-fits-all guide um, on a, some sort of commonly assumed best practice? Uh, I would open that question to the panel. Yeah, maybe you, Sora, could take maybe the first uh, lead on and a reply to that question. Um, sure. So in, in my opinion, it makes more sense to have a specific site by site um, type of guidance. But of course, that takes also a lot more work. And then the question becomes whose responsibility is this? Because uh, can the European Commission uh, issue, you know, many, many types of, of guidances and, and do studies that are site specific or this should this follow member states and if so, who finances it. So I think there is a clear, in my opinion, answer here, but the practicality of putting this into practice is very complicated and this makes it so that often we fall back on best practices. Thank you so much. And maybe I know that we are running out of time here. Maybe just another question also from the audience, Danny, if you have one. Thank you so much. Uh, we, we have a, um, a question here from Thierry Chopin um, speaking about, um, I believe in the context of IMTA, should we be maximizing or optimizing? I believe in the context theory, if you are here, and you'd like to open your mic to, to elaborate more that question. Yes, I mean, in circular economy, we have to be careful because maximizing something could be at the detriment of other things. So I was thinking optimizing is more than maximizing. But another question uh, I would like to ask uh, to watch tech is the, the question of algae. Uh, being macroalgae, microalgae on the case, for example, of the Mississippi River. Um, yes, algae, um, I mean, algae produce oxygen. It's when they die that their decomposition consume oxygen. So some people will say, well, let's grow some more seaweeds on that will take care of the dead zones. Or again, in circular economy, should we go at the uh, origin, uh, the source of the problem, or should we uh, say that uh, really it's fertilizer use, fertilizer application that is the issue? And that's what we should correct. Because, you know, adding more seaweeds and hoping that seaweeds will take care of all the nutrients, it's a band-aid solution that doesn't address the problem at the source. So please, voice, if you will just give a quick response to that question. Uh, I completely here. agree. Yes, I think we should go to the source of the problem, right? Otherwise, we're just putting a Band-Aid on a wound that will never heal. We need to close the nutrient loops, right, at the source. Uh, stop mining uh, mineral phosphate and transporting it, but producing organic fertilizers from the waste that we produce. Uh, so that's a, a quick answer to that. And I think uh, you're absolutely right with that case. Uh, and I think algae, in, if we're not controlling it, like it happens in a dead zone in Mexican Bay, it can cause a lot of problems. But in a controlled environment, I hope that it offers a lot of solutions as well when it comes exactly to carbon capture and storage, right? Thank you so much. Unfortunately, that was all the time that we had for this first block, but we will definitely have new opportunities for the audience to submit answers and also to join the floor both in the next session and also in the final third block of this event. 
Thank you all to our prominent experts and speakers for this first block. So thanks for everyone for tuning in with us for this event, Aquaculture Goes Circular. We are broadcasting live from Norway in Bergen from the Knowledge Hub of the Aquaculture Industry. And my name is Tanya Hoon, and I am moderating this event. We are now ready to kick off the second block of this program where we have invited some really interesting circular case studies from the aquaculture industry. You will now be presented three interesting case studies and then we will have a panel discussion both with our speakers and some invited experts. And again, encourage everyone to join the conversation Remember to use the hashtag aquaculture circular and also remember to post your answers in the chat and also to use your digital hand during the panel discussions. I'm very excited to present our first speaker that will kick off this session is Killian Cherry, who will share some of their application from Wageningen University of Research on aquaculture's contribution to circular economy. Please welcome to the floor, Killian. Hello, good morning everyone. Please let me share my screen first. Yes, perfect. Uh, thanks a lot for having me today. Uh, my name is Kylian Shahi, and today I will present you uh, my view of what circularity means uh, in aquaculture together with another view of the research done by uh, my group, uh, Aquaculture and Fisheries Group at Wageningen University. One of the very first questions that comes on the table when we talk about circularity in aquaculture is simply, what does it mean? To help, answering, to help answer this question, we can use a set of five principles that have been defined to provide biomass use towards a circular bioeconomy. But what are these principles about? The first principle is about safeguarding the health of our ecosystems by respecting their regenerative and carrying capacity. The second principle is about avoiding non-essential products and the waste of essential ones. The third principle is about using biomass in the most effective way. And the, the fourth principle is about uh, utilizing and recycling byproducts. And the fifth principle is about minimizing energy use and developing renewable sources. For timing reason, of course, I will not go through all these aspects and will focus on some. Before going into these principles, it's very important to understand that circularity and its principles can be pursued at different scales, from local, for instance, a farm or a site, to regional, the farm plus the water body, to, and global scales, like the value chain, the food system, or the planet. And I will use these three symbols in each slide to explain what are probably the most relevant scales to implement each of these principles. As mentioned before, the first principle is about safeguarding the health of our ecosystem by respecting their carrying capacity. In aquaculture, ecological carrying capacity can be defined as a magnitude of aquaculture production that does not lead to an acceptable ecological impact. And in the case of uh, fed aquaculture, this refers to the ability of the ecosystem to absorb and assimilate nutrient waste streams generated by the animals. This capacity, of course, depends on many factors, including the, the, the size of the farm, but also environmental factors, such as the current speed bathymetry or the sensitivity of local communities. And at ARFI, we are studying the carrying capacity of aquaculture using mathematical models. For instance, the model, these models aim to simulate the fate and impact of solid and dissolved waste on ecosystem depending on these factors. For instance, here on the left, there is the organic footprint of different farms that differ in size. And on the right side of this slide, you can see the nutrient bloom of a farm depending on the season. One of the key ideas behind uh, another principle, which is a prioritized principle, is that we should spare finite resources like water and land. And we should allocate these resources to the food production systems that use them in the most efficient way. One way 
of measuring resource efficiency is to quantify direct and indirect resource use all along the value chain. This can be done uh, using methods such as life cycle assessment or LCA in short. LCA is another key tool that can be used to benchmark resource efficiency among animal production systems as done in this study from UNMSEC or even in this other study uh, from Jeffat et al, which compared the uh, resource use efficiency of different aquaculture products. At AFI, we intend to use more systematically LCA to quantify the resource efficiency of circular systems and to compare it with more linear approach to check and quantify progress. These prioritized principles also imply that we should, we should not use resources, feed resources that are edible to, uh, for humans, uh, because this is what we call feed food competition. Instead, we should use uh, and we should give animals byproducts and biomass that humans cannot or do not want to eat. In aquaculture, feed food competition has not been quantified precisely yet. A study which is still under review estimated that globally around 40% of the resources given to fish can compete with human food. At AFI, an ongoing PhD project aims to provide such estimates for different key species that are produced globally and also to estimate how much fish can be produced using only pit stuff that do not compete with human food. As discussed uh, earlier in this talk, aquaculture can generate inevitable waste streams such as pieces, uneaten feed, and other metabolic wastes. However, along with the reuse and recycle uh, principle, aquaculture systems can be designed to valorize nutrient loss in this effluence. The first example of such systems are INTA, Integrated Multitropic Aquaculture Systems, where species from multiple tropic levels are farmed together. At AFI, we have tried to estimate the potential, the bioremediation potential of different extractive organisms, such as sea worms, mussels, sea cucumbers. Another example of such systems that reuse and recycle nutrients are nutritious ponds. In these systems, Aquafits are designed to meet fish requirements and to stimulate the farm primary productivity, which then become natural food for the fish. So this is another way of applying the same principle. The last principle that I'm going to talk about is the uh, entropy principle. And it's about minimizing energy use and prioritizing the use of renewable energy sources. And in aquaculture, the type and quantity of energy use highly depends on the type of systems under study. Extensive farms, for instance, use mainly natural and renewable energy, while highly energy uh, intensive recirculated systems, uh, yes, they are very energy demanding and they rely on many uh, economic inputs. But on the other hand, the productivity of these later systems is generally much higher. So again, there is a need or methods that allow to quantify and compare the type of, and amount of energy used per production unit to identify the most efficient systems. And this quantification can be performed with emergy accounting, which is a sister method to life cycle assessment to quantify direct and indirect energy flows and provide indi indicators to, in, to evaluate energy quality and efficiency along the life cycle. At AFI, we are also intending to use more systematically this kind of methods to benchmark linear and circular aquaculture systems. This presentation uh, is coming to an end. And as key message, you can remember these five principles uh, that can provide a key framework to define what circularity is and how it can be translated to aquaculture. Do not forget to think at multiple scales. Uh, in the end, remember also that the circularity story uses mostly known concepts and uh, its implementation will require the use, the use of key tools such as models or footprint methods. These are the references and thank you for your attention. 
Thank you so much, uh, Kilian, for providing some very insight examples and also how we can apply these principles when it comes to scaling up circular economy into the aquaculture sector. Our set, second speaker will present pond aquaculture and the contribution it has to circular economy. Please welcome to the floor Bella Urbani from Zent Isvan University in Hungary. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tanya. For pronunciation is fantastic. And the dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to big thanks for the organizer who invite us to present the, uh, the very important information about the pond aquaculture, which is very close to the relation of the circularity. And uh, myself, I, I, I spent um, last 40 years in my life in the, in the aquaculture sector. And now I'm working in the, in the Hungarian University of Agriculture and Life Sciences. This is the brand new university, which established the 1st of February. And now uh, there is a completely new institute, which we can call the Institute of Aquaculture and Environmental Safety, and myself as a, as a head of the, the institute. And uh, this institute located uh, five different places in Hungary. You can see the five different uh, uh, cities. And the main focus of the of the our institute, how can we introduce the innovation results into the into the practice? For 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 example, how can we uh, uh, develop of aquaculture farming technologies with an environmental approach? On the other hand, so it's important for us that. Who can we develop the circular fish farming systems uh, very, very close to the pond aquaculture system? And how can we define the ecosystem services in the sector? It is a key important issue in, 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 in this region. And the other hand, so the, from, from the 2016, the 1st of January, you know, we prohibited the, 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 the uh, uh, commercial uh, uh, aquaculture in the, in, the, in the natural waters in Hungary, so that this uh, uh, waters are under the umbrella of the angling sector. So that other is a very big challenge for us. Who can we establish the condition for fish production for the angling sector? And now the, the last few words about the, our institute. We have a very, very strong collaboration with the private sector. We have a lot of partners, national and international as well. So it's one of the key target point for our institute, how can we develop the, the, the collaboration with the, with the private and the academic sector as well. And now I have to start to talk about the, the pond fish culture. So this is the very, very common in general in the Eastern and Central part of Europe. And this, this uh, aquaculture sector, pond fish culture has a very, very long tradition. Last uh, 500 years, we, 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 we produced the like a similar technology. Uh, so the key basic target uh, uh, infrastructure is an earthen pond. We can produce the fish in the earthen pond. But the difference is, 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 is very, very interesting. For example, in Czech Republic, our Czech friends are, are producing the common carp, market size common carp fish, which means the 1.52 kilograms uh, big fish. Uh, Czechish uh, fishermen can produce it during four years they cannot use for the supplementary feeds for a carp feeding. But for example, in Croatia, this is the, the, the south part uh, uh, of, of the Hungary, very close to the neighbor country, the weather condition is warmer. So it means the carp can, 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 can grow in a little bit faster and the Croatian fishermen can produce the carp during two years. And now in Hungary, you know, the, I have already mentioned you the very, very important fish species is a common carp. So this is the, so it means the Hungary is a carp eater uh, uh, country. So you know that the common carp, we can produce the common carp during three years in our technology, but the common carp has a lot of, lot of interesting parameters, which is very, very useful for the, for, for, for the producing. For example, here you can see the common carp generally use the natural food the developed. So, so, so it is, for example, the balance between the natural food and the supplementary food at 50-50. And you know, the, the supplementary feeding is, is main, maybe we can use the grain feed for a, for, for a common carp. And you know, the common carp is a benthic feeder. So it means they are uh, making the bioturbation in the water. So it means they can release the nutrients trapped in the sediments. 
On the other hand, so it makes the water turbid, and so it means which can prevent prevents the use of dissolved nutrients from moving towards macro vegetation. So it means this deed end for the utilization. You cannot find the deed end in, in this uh, uh, feeding regime. On the other hand, what is the other advantages of the car-based pond aquaculture, for example? We, uh, the old technology in Hungary in the central eastern part of Europe, you know that we uh, uh, general uh, fertilize the water. We can use the manure. And the, from the manure, we can produce the phytoplankton and the other algae, algae organisms. And the phytoplankton, one of, one of the first uh, 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 important uh, uh, feed for the for the for the for example the herbivorous fishes, for example the the, the silver carp, and the other hand from the phytoplankton we can produce the zooplankton, and zooplankton also very important feed for the for the for example the beaked carp and the carp as well, and the other is important issue in in the our pond aquaculture system that we can produce the fish in the polyculture system. What means the polyculture? So it means for example the the main important fish species is the carp. Around 50% uh, of, the, of the fish structure in, in the pond, uh, the structure is a carp. And uh, around 10, 15% is a, is a herbivore species, which means the silver carp, wicked carp, and grass carp as well. And the last 5, 10% is a predator fishes, which are feeding, the, for example, the white fish. So it means uh, uh, this is the very, very useful for, 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 for eat all of the, all of the nutrients in the, uh, from the water. And so I have already mentioned you the previous slide. So the circularity, the compact circularity of nutrients within the system is, a, is a very, very clear. On the other hand, what is the additional circular elements of the pond aquaculture? For example, here you can see the two, two, two opportunities. The one of the, 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 the nutrient rich runoff water we can use for the core production as a, as a, as a irrigation water. And for example, the uh, in, in, in this uh, uh, region, in, in the central eastern part of Europe, there, there are some, some intensive fish system as well. And the run of water from the intensive system we can use, for example, as a source of the nutrients of the ponds farms. It is also for very, very close to the, to the circularity. And uh, the benefits in the very, very important question, which kind of benefits can we, can we offer to the company? For example, here you can see for example, a number of our past and current research and development activities support the potential benefits of the circular economy. What, what, what means this? For example, who can we produce the more effective propagation technologies? Who can we produce more uh, progenies? On the other hand, can we introduce the new species into the, into the aquaculture system? For example, the tench and the, some predator fishes, for example, the perch and maybe the the pipe perch who can be reintroduce the, 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 this aquaculture structure. And the other hand, the, the sustainability of the natural waters for angling. I have already mentioned you the Hungarian natural waters under the, the angling umbrellas. So it means, for example, the artificial spawning habitat development is also the key issue for the, for the angling natural water, water. Okay, and the other is the benefits to the sector. Who can we enlarge the natural production of the ponds? Who can we produce the more and more algae, phytoplankton, and zooplankton as well? Can we can we growing the manure fertilizing or not? So it is also the very very key question. And the other head is: Is there any available to produce the healthy fish? For example, the lower income families. Can we can we growing the beaked carp, the silver carp? Is there any market for these species, or can we produce the uh, some some other fish species? For example, the tench or grass carp as well. And the other benefits, the question to the environment, who, who can be reintroduced and use the trap nutrients? It is the question. The other hand, uh, can we use the artificial wetlands and pond system can provide a broad range of ecosystem services? It is a key question. And can we provide habitats for many other groups of organisms, particularly helping to maintain biodiversity? Okay, thank you for your attention and waiting for the question. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Bella, for that very interesting presentation on pond aquaculture's contribution to circular economy. 
Our last speaker before we open up for our next mm -hmm. panel discussion with our expert and also an opportunity for you at the audience also to be sharing your questions in the chat is David Thomas Davison from Codland in Iceland. Please, the floor is yours, David. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay, so uh, yeah, thank you for having me again. My name is David Thomas Davison. I'm coming from the company Codland. Uh, I just want to uh, begin by saying we, we've been talking a lot about uh, waste and waste management and reducing waste in a circular economy. Um, we actually prefer uh, side streams. That's the word that we use. Uh, what has been happening in Iceland is that- uh, I'm listening to a conference about- What has been happening in Iceland is that um, there has been a lot of improvements in the handling and cooling chains of the cod. And that means that when they are improving the quality of the fillet, they are actually also preserving um, the quality of, of the rest of the fish, the, the bones, the, the innards, the skin. So that ha what happens then is that we have the opportunity to create valuable products from these uh, side streams because of the uh, quality of them. Uh, and that is our mission in Codland, to create uh, valuable products uh, from the side streams. Uh, we were founded by the fishing companies uh, Visir and Thorkut, and also by the fish drying plant Hristak, <coughs> and also the Icelandic Ocean Cluster, or Sjávar uh, What we realized pretty quickly when we were um, thinking about how we can uh, utilize these products is that we actually don't have the mass to create uh, low margin products that we sell in large volumes. Instead, we need to focus on creating high value products with further refined products. Uh, this is also just because um, with fisheries, this is a limited resource. We can't just fish more and more without losing our fish stocks. So we have to go from producing food Hello, yeah, it's okay. For some reason I was muted. Um, we would like to produce, uh, instead of producing uh, food and feed and raw materials from our products, we need to really go into more valuable uh, products such as food supplements, uh, cosmetics and uh, nutraceuticals and even pharma, um, pharmaceuticals. And this is why uh, we want to produce From the fish skin, slide is not changing, sorry. Uh, collagen peptides. From the fish skin, we can make collagen peptides. They are increasingly important as an active ingredient in cosmetics and nutraceutical applications. Uh, today, they are mostly produced from pigs and, and calf skin. And if you see the product marine collagen, it's actually mostly farm, farmed fish. Uh, the reason they are becoming more and more popular and uh, valuable is because there's a lot of research and clinical studies that have shown that uh, regular consumption has beneficial effects on skin and makes, makes the skin smoother and reduces wrinkles and joint health, reduces uh, joint pain. And obviously with the population uh, on average being older and older, the, the demand is really there. So there's only increasing marketing for it. And what is the benefit of using fish skin? Uh, fish skin is, uh, in the case of cod, is uh, mostly thrown away either by fish processing plants or the, by the consumers at home, or they are used for low value products such as uh, mink feed. But what we are able to do is create a valuable product from it. Um, and there's a huge demand for it because um, it's sourced from, sourced from wild MSC certified cod stocks. They have no link to factory farming, such as um, and consumers are often worried about the use of hormones, uh, antibiotics, and animal welfare concern, especially in regards to pigs. They're free from any religious restrictions, and wild fish is not associated with any disease. 
So even though not everybody is willing to pay, um, there is a lot of consumers who are concerned about their health who are willing to pay extra margin for this product. Um, so we have the idea, how do we, how do, we do it? We have started, uh, we are in a technical partnership with a Spanish company called Junta Gelatins. They are experienced producers of gelatin and uh, collagen from, Pepta, uh, from Spain. And we began, began working with them in 2014. And now we have uh, built the factory. And uh, this, is, this uh, operation or this entrepreneurship is really coming from the, uh, from the fishery sector who want to uh, improve their utilization. So we, are the, we started the factory, which is called Marine College in Iceland, uh, with four of the five largest fisheries here in Iceland, which is Wieser and Thorbjörn, the owners of Kaldan, and also Samheri and Brim. Uh, and they are also, of course, uh, Junka Gelatins. And we are very fortunate with this collaboration because uh, Wieser and Thorbjörn and the fisheries, they, they have really good knowledge of the proper handling and properties of the fish. And they also have a lot of knowledge that we can use. And we are also uh, acquiring the technical uh, aspects of the production from Junta Gelatins. Um, funny thing also that happened that we are, yes, we are producing collagen peptides, but we also tried uh, producing cod gelatin. It has very different properties from uh, mammalian gelatin. It doesn't gel uh, as uh, pig gelatin, you know, like from uh, Haribo County, for example. It doesn't stay stable at room temperature. And it has other thermal properties that also make it quite different. So we weren't really sure if somebody would be interested in it. But uh, once we started pushing it, we actually found a, a very large market for it uh, that use it in, in the food sectors and for some medical applications. So just as a happy accident, we have now uh, diversified our product line. Um, also, just finally, for the short presentation, just wanted to see this, uh, show you this slide, which I'm uh, very proud of. Uh, for in a recent study by FAO, we were used as a case study of uh, sustainable bioeconomy. We were actually meeting uh, six of the worldwide goals. So this is just my short presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, so much, David, for an excellent presentation on how circular economy also can increase value creation when it comes to these kinds of marine products. Mm -hmm. I would like to again remind everyone in the audience that we will now soon kick off our panel discussion an opportunity for you to submit your answers to our experts, but also to our speakers. And please keep the conversation live by also using the hashtag circular aquaculture. I would now like to invite to the stage uh, for this panel discussion, my co-host Bergefur Havason. Birger Fuhr, uh, he is the innovation manager of the Seafood Innovation Cluster, also located here in Bergen, and also a partner of the Efficiency Project. Indeed, yeah. I would just like to, in addition to Birger Fuhr, also we will be having panel experts also to join us uh, together with the speakers, uh, Tamas Baldoc from the Aqua Biotech Group, and also Wojtek Wosetski from the Circular Economy, in addition to our eminent speakers, both Bella, Kilian, and also David. My first question goes actually to you, Björn mm. uh, The cluster is working a lot when it comes to driving innovation and sustainability in the Norwegian aquaculture seafood industry. From your perspective, I mean, is there any obstacles that you see or barriers that needs to be resolved for the aquaculture to really embrace circular economy? Mm. Yeah, thank you, Tanya. This is a good question, and uh, some of the answers may be a little bit controversial. However, let's go. Uh, we have to talk about it. Uh, one of the, the biggest issue I find within the industry, as I'm standing in Norway, is actually the focus on volumes. Um, I think we need to give more attention to, to value and value creation. Stop talking about buy products. They're not buy. They are secondary value chains. They're value chains that are highly valuable, as, as David and the other speakers have actually 
spoken very and shown us very clear examples on. Um, but there's another aspect to this as well, and that is how do we express our needs <coughs> to our to our policymakers? Um, we need to have policymakers in place with regulations even um, opening up possibilities to be able to utilize all the all the value chains that we are creating in our industry. And again, we also have to look at the uh, the plastic usage, the CO2 footprint. So we have had so many examples on how much is to be done, but also how how valuable, but how difficult it be as well. I could continue for at least one day. So I think I'll, I'll leave the word to you now. Or actually, I have a question to Thomas, yes, since please. I have him here. Yeah, Thomas, nice to see you. Uh, um, We've been listening to really, really good presentations here, and and your organization is also working very closely with the agriculture industry. You are a very inter integral part of that, as as the project, project efficiency is a good example. Of. Do you see new technologies or or and business models um, where circular economy is transform transforming the business as usual mindset or or or, or methods? I thank you, Boogie. Uh, Yes, it was it was very interesting to see from this three presentation how how long tradition of uh, that that has in the aquaculture and I, I think aquaculture is the forefront of the of the circular economy uh, development and we have uh, lots of uh, opportunities in this industry still. Uh, but I think I think it's important to mention that uh, the aquaculture industry, especially the production part of the industry is in a continuous development. Uh, new technologies are, are coming uh, up. Uh, we are talking for a long time about the IMT systems, the, the integrated multitrophic aquaculture system, but we could see from Bela's presentation that this is uh, already done for thousands of years uh, in the pond aquaculture. Mm. Uh, so this, this new, new knowledge can be uh, integrated also, or this old knowledge can be integrated also in the new uh, technologies. What we see from our perspective as a, as a technology development uh, company, that for example, the biggest uh, change uh, nowadays in the technologies, the, the growing of the recirculating aquaculture uh, systems and uh, integrating of these systems in, in different production systems. Uh, 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, maybe there were only a very few recirculating systems, for example, in the in the Norwegian uh, salmon industry. Mm. Uh, and now the majority of the smalt uh, are produced in, uh, in recirculating systems in Norway. A similar tendency started in the Mediterranean aquaculture as well, where more and more uh, sea bass and sea bean producer companies started to produce large fingerlings in, uh, in recirculating system and stock them uh, to the cages at a, at a certain size, which creates more opportunity, for example, for the circular economy, because recirculating system concentrate the, the side streams, let's use this word, as uh, our colleagues suggested, uh, concentrate the side streams of the, uh, of the aquaculture production, uh, mm. creating a business opportunity to use these side streams uh, more efficiently as well. And uh, uh, I also want to mention that uh, there is a lot of uh, ongoing research uh, in the in the aquaculture industry uh, on this area. Uh, we have our uh, uh, sister and uh, uh, partner projects in uh, in this event as well. Uh, and all these uh, Horizon 2020 projects has some kind of uh, research element, uh, or sometimes even larger uh, elements in the project. Uh, researching uh, on this area. So a lot of new knowledge is generated uh, on this topic, uh, what we have, what we can use. Thank you, Thomas, you are correct. And we could probably discuss this again for all day long because there's so much happening. Um, Wojtek, uh, I have a question for you as well. Uh, I really liked your presentation and uh, I figure we'll be talking more together quite soon. But um, Listening to, to these presentations that we've, we've been listening to now recently, would you say that there's a best way that aquaculture can contribute to the circular economy? Thanks. Um, I think from what I have listened and seen, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm with you. I think aquaculture is part of the solution to the global crisis we're seeing around us with resources and climate change and feeding the world. 
and um, and a lot of it, like we've seen, is circular by design, right? So um, the quick answer is yes. Um, I I saw it. I agree, and I think it's great to be here, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Great, thank you so much, Wojtek. And maybe, Birgit, should we maybe open the floor to some of the audience with yeah. maybe some questions that they have? And again, if you have any specific questions to any of the speakers or any of our panel experts, please also just tag them in, in the chat as well. But Danny, any questions maybe from the audience that we could ask our experts? Hi, yes, uh, I can see a very interesting question here. Um, with regards to a, a different species, what opportunities for circular economy could be applied to things like shrimp shells? So for the shrimp market, question to our experts. Maybe you, Tomas, would like just to open the floor with some of your reflection around that question. Uh, yeah, I, I think these are these are the developments. What uh, I was talking about, uh, lots of uh, lots of new developments are also in the shrimp uh, industry, uh, which, uh, which which creates more more waste streams, which uh, which can be used uh, uh, in the industry. And uh, yeah, uh, so it's a so we, uh, what what I wanted to mention here that we. Well, because this this continuous changes, we will have waste streams which we are not thinking about uh, at the at the moment, or side streams, which we are not thinking about at the moment. So this is why important the knowledge base and the knowledge base what we are what we are generating uh, from the research project uh, at the moment. And maybe you, Kilian, any comment? I mean, is also Wagening also working on some of these waste streams also uh, from these kinds of maybe closed contained systems as well, recirculated aquaculture or aquaculture production? Um, we are working, yes, on valorizing waste streams, um, but more at the farm level, let's say. So basically what what i've uh, uh, shown before so how to grow other um, other species like uh, extractive species from the from the waste streams uh, in the case of shrimp shells uh, yes there are some uh, responses that have been uh, suggested in the uh, chat of course uh, uh, and I suppose that we, I'm not expert on, on, on shrimp. So uh, the first thing is probably to, to look what are the main co-products, byproducts and uh, kitting, yes, is one thing. So how to use this kitting, how to use it in, as fertilizer and other ideas, but I couldn't bring other ideas to this question, to this specific question. Well, thank you. Maybe we'll also see if there's another follow-up question from the audience, uh, Danny. Uh, Luis Parrish has asked a question, uh, I, I think um, directed towards the pond aquaculture, how to improve the concept of nutritious ponds in the aquaculture system. Thank you. The question is very good. And I think we have a two ways. How can we improve the nutrition ponds? The first is, we have to introduce, we have to start to introduce into the uh, pond culture, aqua, pond aquaculture system using the artificial pellet feed. So we can, we can, we can increase very well the, the, the value of the fish meat and we can, we can increase very well the FCR also. On the other hand, we can use the, the manure uh, months by months in the, in, the, in the aquaculture pond culture. But you know, the manure has a very, very strong correlation uh, with the with the dissolved oxygen. So if we uh, establish, if if we produce the prepare and very very sharp and streak uh, 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 fertilized fertilization fertilized technology, so it we so it means we can improve very very high level for the aquaculture production natural feed in 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 the water. Thank you. Thanks, Bella, for, for sharing some insights to that question. Um, we definitely have time to, for maybe one or two additional questions from the audience, Danny, if you maybe have uh, one more that you could share with us. 
We do welcome the audience to raise their hand if they have any questions. I have a question here to Bella. Uh, could you use the circular pond concept for over-fertilized natural ponds in the agricultural landscape? From Ola Oberg. Thank you, Ola. Uh, so this is the very strict question. Okay, the, you know that sometimes in Hungary, some of the fishermen, uh, you know, they use the over-fertilized natural uh, 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 feeds production in, 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 in Hungary. But you know that if the weather, weather condition, for example, extremely poor weather condition, so it is completely, you know, that the big problem in the in the in the distal oxygen level in the in the in, in the in the pond. So it means that we uh, you know that if we advise for the our fishermen, they cannot use the one of the maximum level of the of the of the manure uh, as a higher, you know. So this is the very, very strict situation. For example, in the July, in the August, there is the very, very warm weather uh, condition in Hungary. And if you over manured, over fertilize the pond, so it means you have to produce the many, many dyed fish. So it is a very, very strict te technology. Thank you, Bella. I actually also have a, just a follow-up question to you, Björgur Food, uh, because we know that feed, and already some of our experts have touched upon the question of feed. I mean, feed in our culture definitely has the highest impact when it comes to the carbon mm. footprint. Yeah. And I know that the cluster is also working a lot when it comes to new innovation on novel feeds. Mm. I mean, from your perspective, where do you also see maybe circular economy can also be uh, contribute when it comes to new novel feeds and also to reduce the carbon footprint by what we see on, on feed mm. and novel culture value chain? There are a couple of ways there. Uh, this, is a, this is, again, a question for a whole day <laughs> session. But um, um, feed has a very high energy density. So in, to always focus on increasing the, the, both the consumability and the uptake of the feed in the fish is very, very, very important. And uh, reducing the feast as simply as that. But also if, if, and we are coming into a situation where both closed and open farms can actually gather some of the fecalia going out, taking that back into a closed loop or more closed loop where we, where we harvest biogas or, or, or proteins through, through yeast from, from these processes is becoming into the realm of possibilities. And we see a lot of movement going that way. Um, another thing is how can we then, uh, and I think uh, there was a discussion about the, about the minerals, uh, phosphates. There's a lot of phosphates in both fish bones and the fecalia. We need to harvest that out. And, and it's very dangerous to say that, or it's not dangerous to say, it's very correct to say that we are running out of it in 80 years time but we will be in dire straits well before that happens. So we need to start looking at, can we remove some of the phosphates out of the, the feces, out of the bones of the fish, but also out of the, the, the loose material spreading for cages through algae or through other processes. So I think starting to work with phosphates now is prudent because it's not gonna be straight end in 80 years. That is gonna be degrading situation where we will become in more and more dire straits. That's an, that's an industry, both agri and aqua. So as Wojtek also highlighted, yeah. there's always uh, an opportunity with circular economy and when it comes to trying to solve these kinds of challenges. Mm. Uh, Danny, um, please uh, forward some questions from our audience. Certainly, we have a comment here from Jeannie Ryder. Um, who believes there was a spot on comment uh, regarding the change of focus from maximum production to circular production. Ginny then follows up to ask, uh, how much discussions are ongoing to actually change this mindset in the aquaculture industry from maximum to circular? So maybe you, Killian, will maybe like to take up that uh, as a first lead and maybe you, Wojtek, also can uh, share some of your comments to that. You, Killian, first. Uh, could you rephrase the question, uh, please? Certainly, Killian. Is the mindset changing when it comes to aquaculture, changing into a more circular kind of a mindset uh, and also operational model? Approaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think, and it's kind of related to the previous discussion, if we want to have these changes, we should consider um, to grow 
species that will have low environmental footprints. So we, we have the question about the feed. We don't have any more question about the, the feed if we, if we cultivate uh, extractive species that do not require any feed and that already have a lower footprint. What is the problem with this extractive species is that in the Western world, so in Europe, for instance, we do not really eat uh, seaweeds or extractive species. So this is a problem of uh, about the consumer's demand. So it's a problem that all of us can solve. Do Would you like all of us to eat a seaweed instead of fish in, in during uh, today's lunch? If you, your response is yes, we can all contribute uh, to for more circularity and for more sustainability using just uh, cultures that already exist, that have lower on vital footprint, and it's an easy answer. And maybe you, Wojtek, working with circular economy, I mean, to follow up on, on Killian's answer to that, I mean, how can we actually educate the consumers when it comes to also making more conscious choice when it comes to purchasing more uh, circular economy or sustainable kind of products? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I think sometimes as consumers, we only have bad choice or worse choice uh, in the today's system. You know, it's like we, we need to feed ourselves. But if you go to a supermarket and you want to buy an avocado, uh, and if it's eco-certified or not, it still probably was produced somewhere in Peru, shipped all over the world. And um, I'm not a big fan of putting the blame on consumers. Although, of course, if everyone does something, it adds up to a massive change that we need to see around us. But I think I'm a more of a proponent of a corporate and top uh, down approach because we, we see that um, um, just a selected number of people are actually in charge of huge decisions that influence the whole value chains. Um, nevertheless, uh, coming back to uh, Jenny's question, why is this happening? Well, I think that the short answer, and again, we could talk about it the whole day, is that we are not accounting for negative externalities, right? So today, why is everyone focusing on production and financial gains? Is that because they can, right? Because we're not accounting for carbon footprint yet related to the production. Um, but what we're seeing, especially here in the Nordics, is that people are inc incredibly more uh, conscious when it comes to um, the health aspects of the food they're eating, sustainability, eco-labeling. I think those are all the tools that uh, really inform the consumers and we should absolutely keep up with that. Uh, we should be careful with eco-labeling because the last time I checked, I think there was about 500 different eco-labels, mm. but only a few selected number of them are valid and credible. And we should stick to that when we're putting food on the plates. Uh, as producers, and we should pay attention to that as consumers. I think we should eliminate food waste from our tables. Uh, again, big issue for the Nordics, not so much for the global south. Uh, that's the number one thing we can do for reducing the carbon footprint as individuals, but also uh, supermarkets and, and retailers play a huge role in that. Um, but again, you know, we could talk about this the whole day, but I'll leave it here. Thank you for that brilliant question. Thank you, uh, Wojtek. And I think that definitely this is a very interesting topic also to follow up in our third block when it comes mm. to the policy uh, guidelines as well, because we definitely see in Europe when it comes to consumer preferences, label certification has a huge impact when it comes to consumers' choice of selecting sustainable foods. So really interesting to follow up that discussion in block three. I see the chat is quite active here, Danny. Uh, we definitely have uh, time for one or two additional questions before we need to wrap up for our break. Certainly. I just saw that Jenny did have their hand raised. If you would like to ask a follow-up question, I welcome you to raise your hand again. Uh, in the meantime, I will ask a question here. We've got a, uh, someone asking a question that um, we uh, waste projects such as urine and feces are, are what we definitely consider a waste. Is there any way to valorize these in the aquaculture industry? Uh, Tamas, maybe I could uh, forward that question to you. Yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, there are many, many research uh, on this. Of course, these, uh, these uh, nutrients, the nutrients of, of, of these waste streams uh, are already used in some aquaculture uh, 
technologies, uh, like for example, in the Pond aquaculture. And there are many uh, ongoing research. How can we use uh, this waste stream directly for uh, producing uh, algae, uh, macroalgae, uh, or, or any aquaculture uh, uh, product? But there are also research uh, in that direction. How can we uh, extract uh, the valuable nutrients from uh, from these type of uh, waste streams? So there are uh, many research on this field. And maybe also just to add, I mean, one thing is also waste stream that we can utilize mm. coming as byproducts from the aquaculture production. But we also definitely see good examples of how aquaculture can actually use byproducts coming out as waste stream from other kinds of industries. Absolutely. I know the cluster was also involved with CO2 bio, mm. maybe just highlighting how you use carbon dioxide to produce microalgae. Yeah, that project was scrubbing carbon dioxide out of a factory uh, affluent and switching that uh, value stream, taking it from problem into food for algae in a closed loop system. The output from the system was uh, feed value algae, high in protein and high in, high in oils. So scaling that up would have been a very interesting project. It's still ongoing. Uh, the facilities are wall to wall with a huge oil refinery. So the contrast is obvious there, but it, it shows that if you're creative, uh, problems become value and, and affluence become, become motors or raw materials for new value streams. And I think, I think we, we can't look at any value stream or any affluent or any smoke from any stack as a unique problem. They are unique opportunities. And we can see you open, you often talk about the nutrient release from open fish farms or even the affluent water from rust systems. You can actually grow a hell of a lot of algae from that stream, actually bringing huge value out of that value stream then, which was a problem. So producing macroalgae in Norwegian waters will more or less uh, remove the, the nutrients from, from the water in, I would say within five or seven years, we are looking at a huge growth right now. There are some issues, but obviously there are always issues. So these need to be solved. And I think if we take off this discussion in, in five to seven years, we will see a completely different industry. I can put my money on that, but I can't be more specific necessarily in what, in how, what way it would be different. But there are so many changes ongoing right now both on the table and under the table within companies. We have more questions? No, oh yeah. I think that we, let's have one final question yeah. from the audience sure. before we wrap it up. So, so Danny, over to you again. I welcome Jeannie Ryder to open their microphone and ask their question. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you so welcome. much for uh, letting me on here. Uh, just a, a further comment to my, to my question. I mean, uh, regarding production and production uh, uh, maximum, uh, uh, I mean, the economic system has brought us this far and we, we very often talk about the effects, but not what has caused it. So uh, it, our economic systems say that we should think short term and short term uh, revenue. And uh, I think it's very interesting to discuss that as well. Also, what we, of course, uh, can do in terms of uh, um, develop new techniques and, and think about those streams, but also think about the why, why did we end up here and what in the economical systems do we need to change in order uh, for the, to let the companies be more uh, circular as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think maybe if I could forward that question to you, Wojtek, uh, for a response, how you have found that balance when it comes to also securing that kind of financial uh, growth when it comes to companies also implementing circular economy. Good question. Thanks for the comment as well. Whew, where to start? I mean, <laughs> you know, so what's happening on the corporate level, the biggest, biggest companies out there, they know, you know, one is dependent on phosphate, other needs cotton, someone needs rare metals, and they're seeing it's they're running out of it. And especially now with COVID, you see, you, you, we see what's happening with the supply chains. It's crazy. Um, mm -hmm. big, chains are big changes are happening. And I think a lot of corporates and IKEA was one of the first ones, right? They, they realized like, if we go circular, 
this is the way to how to open new markets, be sustainable or more sustainable while doing so, and also retain the value of what we're putting out there. Buy, for example, there's a lot of circle business models, thousands of them. Um, I think the key is from, from, from a company perspective, retain the ownership of what you're putting out there because that motivates you and it incentivizes you to do so much with that afterwards. You can change the business model. You can let people pay per use, uh, pay, uh, rent them their uh, cars and so many other different things where you don't need to sell and people do not need to own. And you, it incentivizes you to put high value, high added value products out there which are durable, maybe remanufacturable, repairable, and then you can open new business lines by incorporating those new services into how you serve your customers while making sure that you will stay in business in the next 30 or 40 years. Because if you, if you don't change this, you will have troubles relying on the current and traditional supply chains that are feeding the global economy today. Thank you so much. And I think that's a, a fantastic wrap up that business as usual is not an option. And also implementing circular economy is also good when it comes to the profit also of private companies as well. I would like to thank my co-host, Birgit, uh, joining us here live from Norway uh, as well. And thanks so much to our speakers and our panel experts. We will now take a short break and we will kick off again at 12 o'clock. But please remember to keep the conversation going using the hashtag circular aquaculture and also keep posting your questions in the chat. See you all back at 12.
shit. I don't, I don't, I don't miss like one hour of this.
Welcome back to our event, Aquaculture Goes Circular, broadcasting live from Norway, from the University of Bergen in the knowledge hub of Norway's aquaculture industry. My name is Tanya Hul and I'm the moderator of this event. It is my great pleasure to introduce the third and final block of today's event, where you will be contributing with some key messages for policy makers. Having just heard and discussed these business presentations and also the conversation with our panel experts, we would like to now to return back to Mentimeter and ask you in the audience one question. What barriers and burdens do you see in applying circular economy in aquaculture? We will keep this Mentimeter open and we will also revisit your answers to the Mentimeter during the panel discussion a bit later. So please, we encourage all of you to log into Mentimeter and also to submit your answers to barriers and burdens and, and solutions that you see to overcome this when it comes to applying circular economy in aquaculture. For this panel discussion, I would like to invite my co-host, Sora Kovacic from the Universitat Orbeta di Catalunya in Barcelona. Welcome to the floor, Zora. This block will not include any speakers and it will be an open panel discussion and also open for you, the, for the audience to contribute to. So please, we encourage you all to raise your digital hand and also to submit your questions and also question you might have directly to any of our panel experts joining in with us in this session. After this event, the efficiency project in collaboration with the other Horizon 2020 projects will be preparing some policy recommendation on circularity in aquaculture. This will be sent and forwarded to the European Commission. You will all be informed about this after the event, and you will also have the opportunity to contribute and to also to endorse these policy recommendations if you wish to. We would like to now to invite to the floor also to our other experts, Peter Langel from the Hungarian Ministry, Eva and Yedi back to the floor from the Climate Kick, and also Tamaz Badocic from Aquatech Bio Group, back to the floor, and also Birgit van Tongelen from the European Commissions. And again, we remind you all in the audience, please share your questions in the chat. Before we kick off, I would just like to invite Birgit from the European Commission, given that after one of the outcomes of this event will be to write a policy recommendation letter. And Birgit, uh, please tell us more about what your expectation or what kind of input would you like to see coming out of such an event uh, for the European Commission? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that I'm looking forward to receive these uh, policy uh, recommendations uh, that we could use in the further outlining or out rolling out of our policy in this, in this um, in this field. Um, um, as I explained in my presentation, the Commission will develop this um, uh, guidance document on environmental performance that will include good practices and good examples on circular aquaculture. So at this moment, the Commission would really welcome from the aquaculture sector good examples, uh, good practices on circular aquaculture that we can include in this uh, document. The assistance mechanism that will help us um, um, working on this will start uh, early next year. So by then um, we will collect these good practices, research results, and uh, that is in fact the main feedback that, that we would like to, um, to see from you at this point. Thank you so much, Birgit, and really appreciate that you will be listening in to this panel discussion uh, and, 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 and keeping an eye on the conversation moving forward. Uh, Sora, uh, maybe from your perspective, why is it that circular economy is so important when it comes to EU policy? Could you share some of your thoughts and perspectives on that? Absolutely. I think this is a very important question. 
uh, because it allows also to understand how the concept has been evolving in policy. Uh, so I think what is important to think about is what is at stake for policy when um, thinking about the circular economy. And traditionally, sustainability concerns um, were in tension with economic goals. They were a constraint, right? So the economy can grow, but not beyond planetary boundaries. Or there are, we can say that there are limited resources on the planet at that, and that means that there are limits to growth. And the circular economy, what it has managed to do is to change this discourse. Uh, so circular business models are seen as a way of delivering economic growth through circularity and overcoming some of these limits and resources, for example. The circular economy creates this win-win discourse. And I think this is very important because it makes it possible to put environmental concerns on the policy table by transforming what was a tension into a synergy. So the economy will grow by being circular. And what I think is also important to mention is when uh, the first communications on the circular economy appeared in the EU policy scene, and that was in 2014, uh, in, after the economic crisis that followed the global financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, at a time when the EU was worried about creating jobs and picking up economic growth. But now, seven years later, the circular economy has become mainstream. It's part of the um, European Green Deal, for example. But has it really kept sustainability concerns on the policy agenda? I would say yes and no. Yes, because on one hand, the EU has launched the, the European Green Deal and environmental concerns are more present than ever in mainstream policy. But on the other hand, as Wojtek also explained this morning, circularity is not the same as sustainability. So perhaps uh, what was mainstreamed is synergy thinking, which may or may not include sustainability. And I think that's important to keep in mind when talking policy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sor, for providing some contextual framework when it comes to uh, why circular economy is so high on also the policy agenda for the European uh, Commission, uh, definitely. We will now like to invite our panel experts to the floor and welcome Peter Lengel from the Hungarian Ministry of Agriculture. Welcome to the floor, uh, Peter, and great to have you with us live at this event. Taking a perspective from a government view, how do you see it from your perspective when it comes to how policymakers can measure or monitor when it comes to the efficiency of circularity within the food or the aquaculture sector, uh, Peter? Uh, thank you, Tanya. I would say that that's a really good question. And uh, yes, and thank you, of course, for inviting me. Actually, there are a number of existing indicators uh, out there that can be used as a good measure of circularity, such as the rate of recycling or contribution of recycled materials to raw materials demand uh, and so on. And uh, uh, there are also a number of tools uh, developed for measuring the circularity of products, companies, organizations, or entire regions. Uh, um, these can be easily found even online. Uh, and of course, the EU has also uh, um, developed its circular e economy monitoring framework uh, with a number of indicators on uh, resource use. Of course, still there are a number of challenges in this area. One is that uh, such data are currently not collected in aquaculture, at least in Hungary. And uh, I would say that fish farmers are quite reluctant to provide information on what they regard as their own business affairs. Uh, of course, we can make uh, the provision of EMFF or any other support conditional on such uh, data provision, but um, this will only give us information on the recipients uh, of support, not uh, the entire sector. 
and uh, in addition uh, the need of administrations for data are always opposed by the very strong pressure to reduce administrative burden on the producers so i would say it's extremely difficult nowadays to impose any new obligation uh, including that of data provision uh, on farmers and uh, yes and another thing that complicates the issue is that um, as it was um, mentioned i think by many of uh, the previous speakers is that circularity obviously includes whole value chains so the development of such indicators uh, and tools also requires a very strong interplay of many players and ministries uh, just to mention uh, hungary uh, our draft fisheries operational program and aquaculture strategy is strongly focused on issues like sustainability and zero pollution and actively supports actions such as the use of renewable energy, reducing waste and so on. Uh, obviously with the, the corresponding indicators. But uh, in spite of that, uh, uh, there is only one indicator uh, that could be regarded as an indicator measuring properly the progress towards circularity, which is the number of fish farms adopting more circular practices, such as combined intensive extensive systems, pond recirculation or freshwater IMTA. Uh, well, of course, the discussions on the indicators are still ongoing, uh, so this may change in the future. Uh, I should say that Hungary is currently developing its own national circular economy strategy and action plan, which should be uh, adopted by 2023. Uh, and uh, this will, of course, strongly build upon the EU's new circular economy action plan and the updated resource use indicators uh, in the framework of the uh, EU circular economy monitoring framework. So we are very much looking upon the guidance on the guidance and recommendations from the Commission uh, in this respect. So this expectation is mutual uh, between the Commission and uh, member states. Well, that's it for the moment, and I'm looking forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Peter, for, for sharing that and, and really impressive to hear also how Hungary is also now implementing these circular economy policies when it comes to your food sector uh, in driving those kinds of changes, uh, definitely. And I think this is also a very important outcome and, and contribution to such an event as Aquaculture Goes Circular. It's all about having these kinds of discussions about the challenges that we need to address and overcome, but also that knowledge sharing when it comes to how different kinds of regions are adopting and implementing these kinds of new circular business models uh, towards the food industry. So thank you so much for sharing those perspectives, uh, Peter. I would like to invite back to the floor uh, Tomas uh, for Aquatech uh, Bio Group. Um, I mean, from working with aquaculture companies uh, in, in, in Europe and, I, I, and, and so on, from your perspective, how will you say that policy can incentivize a more circular economy approach when it comes to aquaculture operations and aquaculture business practices? Thank you, Tanya. And uh, I will go back to that what we what we learned today and highlight the, the the diversity of the aquaculture sector and the diversity of possible solutions how different uh, production systems uh, implement circularity uh, during their their processes. And I think it's very important to mention that uh, the European policy environment, policy and regulatory environment has to reflect to this uh, diversity. Uh, and it's also very important that, that uh, circularity in aquaculture has many, many other aspects, which are uh, often regulated on a national level, like for example, uh, uh, reusing the, the waste material uh, or, or uh, effluents from a, a recirculating system in a pond system, uh, raise some uh, 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 biosecurity issues, fish, uh, animal welfare issues, uh, and uh, these, these are usually handled on, on national level. So the European policy 
uh, has to to support the the producers, the aquaculture producers, to uh, to change their 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 national regulations sometimes on 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 these aspects. I, I think I think that uh, the assistant uh, mechanism, what uh, Birgit mentioned in in her presentation, which uh, will be launched by the by the Commission to to provide the support for the member states how to implement these these guidelines, uh, it's it, it can be a good tool for uh, to for both of these uh, issue. I think it's very important that the circularity. Uh, uh, mm type of uh, uh, so the circular economy uh, support has to be incorporated in this in this assistance mechanism and uh, i think it can be a good platform to to connect the the knowledge base of uh, of this area generated by uh, european projects uh, research centers on, and also industry participants and connect this knowledge base to the end users the, the fish farmers in the member states, the regulatory uh, bodies uh, in the member states, and I think uh, if we can create uh, such a such a policy environment, uh, uh, this will speed up uh, the process to to develop the circular economy in, in aquaculture. Thank you so mm -hmm. much for for Thomas for for sharing that, and also as mentioned, uh, I think uh, aquaculture goes circular. It's a perfect example of bringing together. Uh, experts from, from both circular economy, aquaculture, and policy. And it's these kinds of arenas that we really need to move these kinds of conversation uh, forward. I would like to now maybe to revisit Menti Method uh, and maybe just take a look at some of the answers that I hope that you have submitted when it comes to some of your solutions on the burdens and barriers that you see when it comes to applying circular economy in aquaculture. So, if I can kindly ask my organizers just to put up the Mentimeter results on the screen and also the Zoom participants so I can just also uh, see what interesting uh, answers that has been shared. So just give us a quick moment to share our screen with you. Hi there. Uh, so studio, we're seeing here a lot of um, a lot of focus on financial investment, uh, short-term economic impacts, short-term profit views. So I think one of the major barriers and, and worries that people have with uh, bringing circularity into their business model is, is the economics. Um, is there any possibility that in the short term, uh, circularity can provide answers without hitting people's bottom line, or does everyone need to take a, a more long range approach to their thinking? Very interesting, uh, definitely. And I also with us in the panel, we also have Eva from Climate Kick. I was just also wondering how, I mean, working also on these climate mitigation factors also with businesses, I know that you have a lot of business partners in, in, in the kick community. How are you actually having these kinds of conversation when it comes to implementing these kinds of circular approaches and also securing that kind of uh, long-term and short-term uh, profit goals that corporate also has? Well, that's a million dollar question. We could say that. Um, it is very difficult and we can also, what I really wanted to highlight that this event is running in parallel with the Glasgow Climate Summit, which really emphasizes the need for urgent and quick action from all of us. And we are having a really nice, discuss really nice discussions today about a lot of details about how things could be done better now, which would not really change um, the, the whole system in we, which we work. However, um, in order for all of us and all of Europe to achieve net zero by 2050, which is just 30 years from now, we all have to change how we ask questions about what is important, what, is, what value do we create for the society on long term. So what in, in EIT Climate Kick we uh, really emphasize with all our partners is to ask the real questions, not just to go down the route of uh, finding the easy, quick solutions, but rather really think, what are we here to do? What, what are our main goals as a society and how we can achieve that together? And what are the, the steps that we have to do 
um, in the next five years and the next 10 years and how, what are the processes we need to put in place to make sure that we do, do not lose track because it's very easy to, for all of us to, to focus on something that we can do rather than always questioning ourselves that are we doing the right things. Thank you so much. And looking at some of the submitted answers or some of the barriers that we need to overcome, I mean, regulations, financial and investments, as you said, Danny, has been highlighted. And what we definitely also see is that more governments are also becoming more active when it comes to really trying to nudge the industry when it comes to also implementing new business, uh, low carbon pathways and, and new innovation technologies. And maybe just revisiting some of your comments, Peter, from, from Hungarian. I mean, from a government perspective, how are you trying to, to encourage your, your, the, the financial community and also the industry from a policy level to really embrace circular economy as a long-term profit opportunity? Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. Uh, well, uh, it's uh, obviously a very complex issue. And as I mentioned, uh, it, uh, it's a multiplayer issue. Uh, of course, uh, the governance uh, can uh, contribute a lot, uh, uh, both by what we say uh, here in the Mentimeter, uh, by uh, adopting appropriate regulations. Uh, but also by educating the, uh, both the consumers and the, uh, the industry representatives. And uh, actually this um, work with the, with the players, I would say it's a crucial part uh, because, um, okay, we have uh, many uh, farmers, um, other players who I would say uh, innovate only when they are forced by regulation as, uh, uh, to do so. But uh, still, uh, if you don't convince them that it's uh, really important uh, for them, be it through campaigns or certification or whatever uh, else method, then uh, they will not uh, stand by it. Thank you. No, and I think that's a very valid point, uh, Peter. We definitely see also that we discussed in the previously block two with the industry example as well, that these labels and certification have been a really important driver, both when it comes to educating consumer on more sustainable choice, but also to incentivize the industry when it comes to really implementing uh, new sustainability efforts or KPIs to their own kind of production systems. And maybe just uh, to have a follow-up question with you, Birgit, uh, because during your presentation, during the first block, you also highlighted the importance when it, come, when it came to educating and infor informing uh, the consumers around circular economy. Could you maybe just share some of your thoughts on how Degemara and the European Commission thinks about how policy can educate consumers on the circular benefits? <clears throat> yes, indeed. Thank you. Um, communication, as I mentioned in the presentation, is an, one of the horizontal objectives of the strategic guidelines. And uh, communication is an, a key area for further work that has been identified in the strategic guidelines, because there is still a lot of um, um, negative perception uh, about aquaculture. So therefore, uh, it, it features very prominent in the strategic guidelines. One of the actions that has been included for the Commission is that the Commission will develop tools for a coordinated EU-wide campaign on EU aquaculture. Uh, that, that, and these tools can then be used at national and regional level. Of course, circularity uh, will be part of this, uh, of this uh, communication campaign. The toolkit will be ready by uh, June next year, and then um, um, it will be disseminated uh, with the member states by the end of uh, 2022. And then another action in the strategic guidelines for the member states uh, that has been identified was then that um, member states should support and ensure a broad dissemination at national level 
um, of the coordinated EU-wide uh, campaign on youth aquaculture and should involve then all the regional authorities, aquaculture producers, retails, NGOs, and also media. And of course, uh, circularity um, should, be, should be part of that. Thank you so much, Brigitte. And we look very much forward uh, to that important work from the European uh, Commission in, in that kind of communication and educating the consumers on the circular benefits uh, in our industry. Um, we would like to now to invite some of our audience also to share some of their questions or answers on how we can overcome some of these barriers. So Danny, any questions from the audience that we could maybe highlight? Thanks so much, Tanya. Uh, I'd like to invite Dominic Duran to open his microphone and ask a question to our panel. Okay, thank you, Danny, and thank you for this very nice uh, 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 debate. Uh, my question would be more in the, in the term of uh, uh, having of having your feedback on on one thing that uh, we see that financial investment comes as uh, the the big part, but uh, I really feel that it is the main barrier when a business is looking for a solution in terms of security for for himself for itself actually, but that uh, the chance of security is uh, the B two B or or business partnerships uh, along the value chain. Uh, so uh, and uh, uh, and there is a number of barriers to to, to achieve that. And uh, uh, I know that the Commission, uh, through uh, through no new calls in Horizon Europe, is also uh, trying to facilitate this by uh, developing uh, this uh, catalog of uh, uh, byproducts and waste from one industry that can be used by another one. And I think it's a very key enabler uh, for for having this business to business and uh, along the value chain. So. Um, this is my own reflection, but I would really like to, uh, to hear the, the panel uh, opinion on that uh, uh, and uh, the, yeah, this, uh, the importance of partnerships and, and enabling partnerships for circularity and also, of course, for the aquaculture industry uh, itself. Thank you. Definitely. Uh, and maybe I could forward that question to you, Tamas, working with the aquaculture industry, how you see the industry actually also working with other partners, R&D, or also other industry partners across the value chain to really see that kind of new B2C or B2B kind of circular uh, partnerships uh, emerging in the sector. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I see this uh, happening uh, on, uh, uh, in, in many, many areas. First of all, of course, the, in the research, and the technology development sector, it, uh, it has a long tradition uh, uh, of the cooperation of different sectors. Uh, uh, and uh, maybe this uh, is in the forefront of, of this process that uh, we are working together uh, from, from experts from uh, totally other industries and uh, integrate uh, their knowledge, their experience uh, in aquaculture including the, uh, the circular uh, economy knowledge as well. But uh, what I see is also happening on, uh, on, in, in the industry, in the, in the practice as well, uh, especially the, uh, the, the connections between agriculture and aquaculture is uh, getting more and more tight. Wow. No, aquaculture is a new industry. It took time to, to discover this industry and acknowledge this industry for the other food production sectors. But uh, what I see now that there are more and more companies who are coming from the food uh, production sector, especially from the agriculture, who are open it for the, for the aquaculture and uh, start to produce a kind of uh, aquaculture, start to, uh, uh, and a kind of uh, aquaculture production. And of course, they bring uh, with them their uh, side streams as well, which can be used uh, in the aquaculture. So yes, I, I, I think it's, it's happening, but it's good if it's facilitated uh, by, by the policy and the communication as we, as we discussed earlier. Maybe just to follow up with that uh, uh, question to you, Eva, as well. I mean, Climate Kick is all about facilitating these kinds of partnerships. And 
And what kind of benefits do you see coming out of these kinds of partnership when it comes from a more like an industry corporate perspective? Um, well, I think the biggest benefit is the creation of a common language and common goals across different uh, actors. And I think this is also the, the biggest benefit of this whole circular mind uh, mindset that circular economy is introducing into the European economy and also the, the policy making is that you cannot work in isolation because you are you do not exist in isolation. So everything we do will affect uh, our neighbor, our the next um, um, industry that we work together. So we will have to, we cannot, even, even if this event, and I think it's a really good comment from Dominique that we are focusing on aquaculture, but aquaculture depends on uh, biodiversity, depends on water, depends on uh, resources from other value chains. Um, so I think this is something that we all have to get used to and have to be comfortable with. It's not something we see and it's obviously very difficult to do, uh, but this is a mindset that we have to start developing and, and applying into practice, uh, even if it's, if it's hard. We just have to get over it because we are really um, needing to step up action to achieve a more sustainable future for all of us. Thank you so much, Eva. And maybe, Danny, there are for other questions from the audience. Thank you so much. Yes, I'd like to invite, please, um, Thierry Choplin to open their microphone and ask their question. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, good morning from Canada. Um, I was... Um, commenting that uh, uh, <clears throat> I think we have to do uh, quite a lot of work with ecosystem services. Uh, at the present time, I think people, the general public is starting to understand ecosystem services, uh, but uh, still we have a lot of education to do. So the first step is to, that people be aware of ecosystem services. The second step, and that's exactly where we are at the present time. The second step will be to monetize ecosystem services, give them a value. We, we are starting to do it. I, I have done it with nutrients, um, with seaweeds uh, worldwide. Uh, so we have to monetize, monetize uh, ecosystem services. And then the third step will be to use that uh, to develop uh, regulatory and financial incentives uh, so that people will finally see why it's worth to change practices, uh, develop other uh, practices in aquaculture. And, uh, and of course, I work with integrated multitrophic aquaculture and there are a lot of ecosystem services provided by IMTA and we need to put a value on that. The, the second aspect is um, at the present time, I think we focus too much on carbon. It's all carbon, carbon, carbon tax, carbon tax. Uh, um, it's about time we switch also to talk about nutrient credits. And I much more like to talk about credits than taxes because we should reward people that do a good job. So with credits. And as a matter of fact, we should look at nitrogen credit, phosphorus credit. And there is much more money to be made with nitrogen and phosphorus credit than on carbon. Uh, people never do the calculation to the end. There is a, the carbon tax is per ton. The nutrient credits are per kilo. There is a factor 1,000. Nobody pay attention to that. So there is more money to be made with nutrient credits. And uh, we should talk about that because it's also a direct link with uh, um, uh, coastal acidifications. Uh, we always talk about... Uh, uh, carbon sequestration, climate change. Uh, we should also talk about uh, um, deacidification of the coastal environment. Thank you so much for sharing the interesting perspectives. I also just wanted to highlight a bit what was just shared when it comes to how to incentivize also the investment community. Uh, coming myself from an invest as an investment company, I think. We were just also seeing the power that also to incentivize the community around that. And maybe a question to you, Birgit. Uh, 
The EU taxonomy, I will definitely see, has been a very powerful instrument to engage and also to involve the financial community when it comes to forwarding through the low carbon pathway uh, and to the EU's Green Deal. How does circular economy fit into the EU's taxonomy? Of course, we know that our culture has not yet been adopted to EU's taxonomy, but what conversation has been done on a policy level when it comes to circular economy and the EU's taxonomy? I'm afraid I, um, I cannot comment on that because I have not been involved. So um, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> No worries, no worries, uh, not at all. Uh, but maybe again, getting back to you, Peter, uh, from, uh, fr from the, the government side of things, looking into the complexity, as you mentioned, from the industry and also the collaboration that needs to be done across member states, how from a government level will you see these kinds of partnership can also help you from a government perspective to facilitate and accelerate circular approaches to your industry uh, across member states moving forward? Uh, well, I, I would say that uh, it would uh, facilitate our work a lot <laughs> because, uh, you know, um, finances are always limited. And especially if you think just about, uh, you know, uh, mm, non-returnable uh, supports from governments and uh, or credits so uh, the more we can get uh, investors uh, interested in that uh, the the bigger uh, the perspectives are very briefly <laughs> great thank you and um Maybe we should also now switch back to Mentimeted. Uh, when we first kicked off this session, we did ask the audience for what your actually thoughts uh, was and association when it came to circularity in aquaculture on that topic. And it will be interesting maybe just to share within this channel here to my organizing team has that kind of uh, uh, associations changed during this kind of a program uh, moving forward? So the team will soon get up the, the, this slide, uh, definitely. So the link has already been posted now on the chat. So if you can maybe just be kind enough to just resubmit your answers to the same topic, what comes to your mind on the topic of circularity aquaculture, and we will do a comparison uh, by the end of this session uh, to see if this event has changed some of your uh, understanding and knowledge around the topic of circularity in our culture. But getting back to you, Danny, are there any further questions from the audience that we could highlight? Thank you so much. Um, I have a question here from Phil Jay. Um, they have asked, could the panel comment on how they would envisage occurring, uh, encouraging investors and investment in the circular economy? I, I believe on a wide scale, not just I don't know, business to business approach or just not just existing businesses. So um, how are we putting a value on these, these services uh, to investors and investment? Uh, anyone from our panel that would like to uh, take that question? Hello, Tamash is, Tamash is here. Yes. I, I think we have to mention here the green bond. Uh, systems of financing too, which is quite uh, broadly used already in many industries, but I know only one example from the aquaculture industry, one of the largest Norwegian salmon producer uh, launched the green bond system, maybe Tanya, you know more, but I think uh, this is a mechanism which will, uh, and it, 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 it will be more uh, common in the aquaculture industry, this will uh, facilitate uh the the investment into the circular economy type of uh development thank you very good point and maybe sora from 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 your perspective has there been any good example from like from a policy level that you have seen when it comes to how they can incentivize or motivate the investment community uh, within the, um, engaging into this kind of circular uh, approaches 
Uh, well, I'm not an expert in aquaculture exactly, too, so I'm, I wouldn't be able to give an example um, of financing in this in this sector. But maybe any other options when it comes to broader into the food industry? I think the green bond is a good example, uh, but maybe what role do you see policy actually play when it comes to incentivizing that kind of, of investments? Is it more like a private public kind of a partnership that could be helping that kind of attracting more investments? Or do you see that uh, it has to be really uh, more from the private sector? Or how do you see those partnerships moving forward within the circular economy from a private a public kind of a partnership uh, approach? Right. Uh, well, I, I mean, there's uh, probably space for both uh, partner, uh, public uh, private partnerships and, and partnerships between different private actors. I think also a question here is uh, the timing and uh, timing on one hand and also what is the best use that can be done of um, limited um, economic resources in, in government. So is this the policy where um, most resources should be invested? And how long should uh, public uh, private partnerships be supported for? And at what point, uh, if viable, is industry expected to go on on its, on its own? And I think um, I don't have a clear answer for that. And I think that maybe, uh, I don't know if there's enough um, knowledge uh, to answer these questions. There are still a lot of knowledge gaps, as Birgit was also pointing out before, to understand um, the potentiality of, of circularity and if it's worth investing in this uh, along with other policies. So what I, uh, part, part of what I'm trying to say is also that maybe a little bit of caution is needed because there's definitely a lot of opportunities, but there are also, we haven't spoken so much about risks and uncertainties and, and what could um, go wrong or what regulation could be needed to prevent some unintended consequences. And uh, so I think that um, collecting knowledge also about these risks is important in uh, uh, evaluating where to invest. And that's a very important uh, point, uh, Sora, that also identifying some knowledge gap uh, in, and to see how we maybe need more research to be done is also, I assume, a very important part of that policy recommendation uh, within circularity and aquaculture. Before we also maybe, I just want to kindly remind you to submit your answers to the word cloud when it comes to what comes to your mind on the topic of circularity aquaculture. So we will be soon sharing your answers, but before we share the Mentimeter results, uh, maybe another question from the audience, Danny. Thank you so much. Um, what we saw actually in this um, barriers uh, Mentimeter is lots of people were mentioning antimicrobials, the chemicals that we use in the industry and the medications um, as they see this as a barrier to their circular approach. Um, I would ask to the panel, do they see that this is a barrier? And if so, is this something that needs to be solved at the same time as we solve circularity for aquaculture? So maybe Tamas, if I could forward that question to you to kick it off. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I, I think these are these are barriers, uh, of course, but there is a lot of research and a lot of development uh, going uh, uh, on this field. So, for example, to to reduce the the amount of ultimate microbials used in the aquaculture. I, I we can say that this is a kind of success story of the aquaculture research and development in the past few years. Uh, vaccination is taking over the, uh, the role of the, the antimicrobials in the, in the industry more and more. And uh, the number of uh, vaccines what the, what the industry is developing is, uh, is, is still growing in terms of species and in terms of uh, diseases as well. So, uh, these processes will, will, will help. And I also high, would highlight again the, the diversity of the, uh, of the sector. 
there are uh, segments of the aquaculture production where we don't use any chemi any chemicals or we don't use uh, any antimicrobials uh, which uh, which are uh, still uh, uh, excellent uh, uh, possibilities for for the circular economy and maybe just a question back to you, Eva, uh, as a representative of some of these knowledge and innovation communities under uh, the European Commission. How do you also work across these kicks when it comes to implementing the circular uh, economy approach? We have eat food, we have climate kick uh, and so on. How do you also ensure that kind of uh, collaboration across these wider kind of innovation communities uh, in Europe? Well, we have um, a so-called cross-key collaboration platform, and, and I'm actually I'm one of the, the project managers uh, focusing on water scarcity. And within this project, we five of these knowledge and innovation communities we collaborate together to find innovative solutions to to water scarcity. And uh, I'm representing Climate Cake, focusing on obviously climate change and its societal impacts. But we work very closely with EIT Food, who is leading this project. And we have representatives from manufacturing and EIT digital. So there, are, for one issue, there are many different angles we can take. And it's very important to bring in these larger communities representing the different angles of, this, of society and, and industry and, and economy in general to make sure that we do not miss uh, important angles. But it's still very, very hard and it's, it's hard work, uh, a lot of hours of uh, working together and challenging each other's ideas. Because what I think, and also in all of these events, what we see, we, we all come in with um, no, known knowns. We know what we know, but we don't know what we don't know. And it's really uncomfortable recognizing that, uh, especially when they put you on the spot in a, in a, in a, in a webinar. But we have to be comfortable with that because we don't know everything and it's fine. And I think circle economy is actually helping us with that because it is really putting you on the spot to question your boundaries and where, uh, where you need to uh, develop new skills, uh, where you need to bring in new actors and uh, where you can really create an ecosystem, a circular ecosystem where you include more and more actors. And it's never going to be uh, perfect. And I think Wojtek would be, would, and, and Zora, as uh, you mentioned before, circularity has its limits. We might not get to 100% ever, and it's it's okay. But we have to, and we, we must progress. Thank you. So while my organizing team maybe shares the results from the Menti method, just a quick question to you, Peter. Has that been a challenge from, from your perspective into implementing a circular economy policy when you have so many different business sectors? Uh, um, what has been your learning so far around that? Um, yes and no. <laughs> so uh, as... Uh, uh, as Tamás has already mentioned, uh, of course, um, we are talking about an extremely uh, diverse sector, even if we talk only about aquaculture. Uh, if we look at uh, the possible interactions with uh, all of the other sectors, uh, this, this picture is getting even more diverse. And, uh, of course, uh, trying to achieve circularity is a tremendous challenge uh, in a, such um, um, environment. However, this is also, as it was previously mentioned, uh, it's also a big opportunity. And uh, again, talking about uh, Hungary, we have very long traditions of integrating uh, our aquaculture pro uh, production, not, uh, not only uh, within aquaculture, but with uh, other cultures, uh, animal farming uh, um, and uh, plant farming, uh, anything. So uh, basically uh, looking back to what we already know uh, is uh, can uh, provide us with very good solutions uh, um, even regarding where we want to move uh, in the future. So um, 
briefly, yes, there are uh, many challenges. Uh, uh, we have to find the, uh, I think uh, Eva said uh, that uh, 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 common language and common mindset uh, with uh, other businesses as well, but uh, it's doable and must be done. Thank you so much, Peter. And I see that the organizing team have now uh, shared also the word cloud around um, what comes to your mind on the topic of circularity in aquaculture. And I think the key question here has, has it changed? Um, so I'm not sure if the organizing team, can you also share what was posted as the first in one minute? Uh, we will soon get also a comparison when it comes to what did you share with us at the beginning of the event to see if that has changed now after uh, the event. But before we maybe just kick off uh, with sharing that immensely meta results, uh, getting back to you, Sora, just listening to these conversations from the panel experts and the questions coming from the audience, what will you maybe say are some important uh, topics that is whether we need to address further in that kind of a policy recommendation letter from your perspective. Thank you, Tanya. Um, so a lot of very important topics have been brought up, brought up like the issue of long-term and short-term, which can be sometimes an intention uh, with mandates uh, and uh, the kinds of policy. So that, that is always a challenge and, and it is here too. The issue of urgency was brought, brought up um, which is interesting because the circular, circular economy intersects with other issues like climate change that have their own urgency dimension, but also with the practicalities sometimes of um, how guide, guidance documents and information is collected. And uh, often member states are uh, asked to provide information and case studies uh, by tomorrow, and there is an urgency also in the way that people work that doesn't always allow for enough reflection about the complexities uh, that um, this type of policies entail, and so that I think is important also to keep in mind. And I would like to raise maybe one more issue or question, which is who defines the circularity and who benefits from circularity? So we mentioned at some point the issue of measuring circularity, the indicators that are used, and indicators, they play a very important role in policy, of course, because they help setting targets and measuring progress towards targets, but also they tend to focus actions on what is measurable. And there may be non-measurable areas that are also require work and are important to take into account and when circularity is defined only by indicators, we may become blind to um, what is non-measurable. Um, and so I, I think it would be interesting to involve in the conversation, think who, uh, of who is not involved in the conversation yet. So businesses we, we spoke about, uh, but what about, um, I think Peter was mentioning earlier, the, the uh, fishermen or, uh, communities that maybe don't have direct access to these conversations and what does circularity mean to them and how would it benefit if it would benefit them? Because if there is the, no benefit, then there is also no viability and no interest in uh, taking this forward. So I would, yeah, I'd like to add these this questions to the table. Thank you so much, uh, Sora, uh, definitely. Uh, so before maybe we, we get up the better, better results, uh, there still is time for one or two follow-up questions from the audience. And Danny, um, has anyone raised their digital hand or submitted an interesting question that you could share with us? Thank you so much, Tanya. Uh, Theo Chopin, I would invite you again to open your microphone to ask a question of our panel. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was more an observation than a question. Uh, this spring, we had uh, the Monaco Blue Initiative. It's, uh, there is an edition every year. And this year, it was quite interesting. It looked at uh, how do we move from philanthropic support to financial support. Uh, it was very interesting because um, philanthropic support, people start to realize 
it's great, but it's short term. Generally, it make a big splash with an announcement, but uh, after a little while, it disappeared. And especially with COVID-19, uh, the Global South were saying, um, where are you, Global North? You are, <laughs> we haven't seen you for a while. You are not there. You are not going to uh, South. You are not supporting us. So where is all this support? And financial support, it was very interesting at the Monaco Blue Initiative. There was a number two of the Banque de France was there, and she uh, was uh, right involved in, uh, yes, do we go from green bonds to blue bonds? And I mentioned we should go turquoise bonds, uh, green plus blue make turquoise. And what she was saying is that we, all of us, can have a direct action, you know, with uh, what is called corporate social resp uh, responsibility, is uh, when you go to your bank and you say, okay, uh, I want to work on investing for my pension plan. Well, you can decide on which company you invest and you can uh, apply pressure. Uh, if we all do it, apply pressure on corporates and uh, corporations um, through that aspect. So in small little impact, uh, but accumulation of impact, uh, you know, how do you invest, in what do you invest your pension plan can be very effective. Thank you so much for sharing uh, some really uh, important aspects around finance and investment, definitely. So maybe the organizing team can now share the Mentimeter results uh, on the word cloud. I am very interested to see if this has changed during the event here. So the first slide uh, is then what you actually submitted as you answered what came to your mind on the topic of whole culture with one word. And this other slide uh, on the right hand is definitely also what has been submitted as you answer now at the end of this event. And there's definitely something that we see has changed. Sustainability is still at the core. So that has not changed. So definitely the audience sees that circular economy can really drive and increase the sustainability performance of the aquaculture industry. We see now IMTA, ecosystem services, nutrients, cooperation also coming into play when it comes to uh, the submission of the answers now later in this event. And I think that also reflects really nicely also some of the conversation that we have had through the panel experts uh, and also through the uh, prominent speakers that we have seen uh, today. We have uh, unfortunately come to the end of this event. I will really like on behalf of the efficiency project and all of our collaborative partners like to thank you all for tuning in with us today. I would like to thank all of our speakers, our panel experts and you as audience for tuning in with us today and sharing some really interesting perspectives on how circular economy can be applied into the aquaculture industry. Please keep in mind that your input and discussion from today's event will continue when it comes to shaping a new policy recommendation letter for the European Commission. So we look really much forward to driving this conversation forward and also to keep the conversation going on the hashtag circular economy and also hashtag going circular. So please, if you have further questions or comments or reflections, please share it on the chat. And I'm confident that the organizing team will also implement all of your answers and thoughts into this policy letter moving forward. Thanks all and remember that our culture is going circular. Have a great week ahead. Thank you from us in Norway, in Bergen.